So, and how frequencies of words play a part in understanding language automatically. So, first let's cover what a corpus is. A corpus is a large amount of text. So, for example, a corpus can be divided into documents. So, for example, the Senate speech is between whatever, whatever Congress among, you know, throughout the years. And we have one speech that, uh, that is transcribed as follows. Mr. Chafee, that's the name of the congressman, of the senator, that says, Mr. President, three days ago in Palo Alto, California, blah, 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 blah. He had a semi-graph appearing visage, but he was extremely fair, blah, blah, blah. This is everything that this senator said on a given day. Then there's another senator discussing a different matter. So every senator's speech, for example, can be a document in the corpus of Senate speeches between the 101st and 109th Congress, for example, <clears throat> of the United States. Now, there are other corpora, though, that have a lot more information than just the text. For example, there's the New York Times corpora. There's a big chunk of all the New York Times articles between, uh, I believe, some 20 years, uh, over 20 years. Now, they have tags that denote what the elements mean. So, for example, here's the headline tag, headline tag, and the, here's the closing of the headline tag. So between these two tags, there are headlines of the article. This is the first headline, headline one, and then a seated tour of Europe, and that's where the that's the end of the headline tag, and so on and so forth. And then there's an abstract, P denotes a paragraph, and it's this one: chairs of 1920s and 30s are featured at the Johnston and Hicks Museum, blah blah blah. And this is another another text, right? That it's annotated that that you know it's an abstract, it's not a title. So you know a little bit more about the text. In this kind of annotations, there could be tags for entities. So for example, there could be a tag for person, right? For person that tells you what persons are named in the article. So corpora can be highly annotated or just simply text. <clears throat> now when we look at frequencies, so for example, for the Senate speeches, we start looking at how often do words occur? And we see that, that the word the is the most frequent with, uh, with uh, 7,300,000 um, occurrences, approximately. And we see that the most frequent words, <clears throat> which would intuitively be keywords for the text, are not so much keywords. They carry very little information. If I say that, oh, your text contains, you know, the most frequent words in, in this amount of text is, are the, to, of, and, in, a, that is, i, for, you still have no idea what the text is about. So perhaps the most frequent words is not the best way to understand the text. And that's how frequency can start telling us something. So let's look at the least frequent words then. <clears throat> These are more informative words in the sense that, okay, there's, for example, semi-graph appearing. That appears only once, and it actually appears in one of the speeches, that, in one of the transcriptions that I showed you earlier, right? It is very specific. This word is very specific. If, if I say semi-graph appearing, I know, at least I know exactly what senator said that and in what context, because I can go find exactly where, where that was, right? Uh, by dash she, if I can find the string in my text, I know exactly what these people are talking about. <clears throat> But the problem is that these words won't tell me what the document is about. <clears throat> Excuse me. They won't tell me what the document is about. However, they're very discriminative. They're very informative in terms of information about which document they occur in. Now, to get word frequencies, right, if you're using Python, there's the collocations library that can help. There's also Python packages like NLTK that help find all these things uh, very easily. Here's just a little bit of how to use the collocations library if you were to open a file and give it to it. Now, the important part of the collocations library of the counter class in particular is that you have to give it a vector of words, okay, or a ve vector of tokens. Let's forget Python for a moment and let's talk about this phenomenon of the most um, frequent words that we just looked at. There's a law, uh, Zipf's law, that states that given some corpus of natural language utterances, the frequency of any word is inversely proportional to its rank in the frequency table. Here's the formula for roughly what the formula is about. But what this really means is that if you're ranked word number one, 
that means that it occurs a ton of times, a lot of times, okay? If you're ranked number two, then it occurs a lot, a lot of times, but not as many as one, right? It's inversely proportional. So as, as you move down in the rank, you move down in the, um, you move down in the rank, you move uh, uh, down, if you, as you move up in the rank, you move down in frequency. Now, or the higher the rank, the lower the frequency, if you will. Now, basically, roughly speaking, this says that the most frequent word will occur approximately twice as often as the second most frequent word, three times as often as the third most frequent word, and so on and so forth. Of course, this is not exact, exact, but let's look at the sentence speeches in the graph, right? So if this is the frequency, the word the happens here, that's 7.3 million times. Two happens roughly 3.8 million times, it's roughly half off and and then it starts going down like this. This resemble what we call a Pareto distribution. So the Pareto distribution goes like that, right? Now, if you want to examine the frequencies of words and you want to examine the words that you're interested in, right? So for example, all these words here are words that are not informative. So we can look at this graph here, right? These are the words that are not informative. If we were to extend the graph, to extend the graph a lot, right? And then extend the distribution, we will see that the informative words might start appearing in this range. But we won't tell which one's more informative or which ones happen more than others because the differences here are almost indetectable or, or they're hard to visualize. So what people do in these cases is sometimes they will take the logarithm of the frequencies to plot the line. Why the logarithm? Well, if you think about it, for example, uh, the logarithm <clears throat> in base 10 of 1000 is 3, right? So the logarithm in base 10 of 500 is 2.6. So instead of having, for example, the top most word be here, and then the second, mo top, uh, the second most frequent word be here, you'll have the first one and the second one very close in scale. One would be at the 3 mark, and the other one would be at the 2.6. So if these are 1s, one would be at the 3 mark here, and the other one will be at the 2.6, so roughly here. You start the line, instead of being so curved, starts being more like this right with this being an actual zero here we can see for example in logarithmic scale the occurrences of, of certain words and these are the ranks of the words are uh, the log of the rank and these are the words and we can see what words occur the most and there's high variation over here and so on and so forth that is the zips flaw and the Pareto distribution which is how language usually behaves. Now let's do this with, uh, let's let's follow a little example now that will show us a few, uh, that will give you, us, that will give us a few insights on how to understand text automatically. So the first thing is that whenever you have a word, uh, a text, one of the hard things to to decide is what am I going to consider as a word? We also say that's a unigram, that's word. Um, so which unigrams am I going to pick? What, what am I going to look at? Am I going to say man's man apostrophe s be one word or am I going to say man and then the apostrophe s be a second word that denotes something else? Am I going to think that 10-fold is two words or one word? All these decisions need to be made. Also, because you will be parsing with a computer, is fresh comma the same as fresh without the comma, right? Is considered semicolon the same word as considered without a semicolon and so on and so forth so there's some decisions to be made here right so you can try and find you know how to get these words out you know in, in python if you if that's the language you're, you're deciding to right but this is a decision that comes from the person working with the text now 
if I just um, if I just decide to split the words in spaces, and, and what I will consider a word is anything between spaces. So no wonder dogs are called man's best friend with a period, their loyalty with a comma. If I just consider you know to separate in spaces, and those are my words, we can see that the most frequent words of these one, perhaps two words are telling me something about the text of the least frequent words because it's, it is a, a small set of text you see you know a few other words that might, might be telling you a little bit about the text but not so much because it's such a small text you can most frequencies are ones or twos so there's not much difference between these two right but you can see that unigrams will give you this information However, <clears throat> there's this concept, the concept of an n-gram, where n is the number of words that you will be considered consecutively. For example, a trigram means n equals 3, will consider three words at a time. The doctor said that would be one trigram. Okay? Bigrams, where n is equal to 2, would consider the doctor, for example. And if you wanted to determine bigrams, for example, in this phrase, the bigrams of this sentence here, the doctor said that the TARDIS needed repairs. Oh no, said Amy. The bigrams of this phrase, of this sentence are the doctor. The next bigram is doctor said. The next bigram is said that. The next bigram is that the. The following is the TARDIS. TARDIS needed. And so on and so forth. It's like a moving window of two words that move one word at a time, right? Under the same token, trigrams would be the doctor said, doctor said that, said that the, and so on and so forth. If we continue doing this, right, that the TARDIS, the TARDIS needed, uh, TARDIS needed repairs, needed repairs O, oh, repairs O oh, no, O oh, no said, no said Amy. Right? That's where my trigrams end. It is important to notice that the trigrams, if you're if you're writing an algorithm to go over the whole list, in this case for trigrams, where n equals three, it is important to know that you will go over the string one word at a time, but you will stop three words before ending the string, right? In the same case, if n is equal to, you'll stop two words before ending the the string or the or the sentence. But this is the concept of n-grams. Now, n-grams can be more informative because n-grams, um, <clears throat> like unigrams, bigrams, or trigrams, they can capture something about the text. So very quickly, one small Python implementation if you want to discover n-grams would be something like this. I will leave this for the viewer to find out how this works. But Let's continue. So n-grams can be more informative. So if I find the top five n-grams of the same text that we saw earlier, again, just for convenience, I'm going to put it here. It's about dogs and ownership of dogs and how dogs are the best friend of man. The n-grams here, the bigrams, will tell me a dog owning affections. This is telling me a lot about the text. These bigrams really capture some of the meaning of the text. So it is important to understand that unigrams are really helpful for some things, bigrams can be really helpful for other things. Now a bigram is a set of two words that go together. We also call that in natural language processing collocations. Okay, These are words that go together, that, that usually go together. So say for example like we said, these are much more descriptive. Say, for example, we have, these are the top bigrams now of another corpus, the New York corpus. Of the, in the, to the, and so on and so forth, we have New York here. But now here, the, the corpus is so big that even with bigrams, we can't really tell what documents are about. Okay? It's, they're not very discriminative. However, a technique to get collocations or bigrams to be more discriminative is to filter them by part of speech. So I will get all the bigrams, right, in a given document. 
but I'm only going to filter the bigrams that follow, for example, an article followed by a noun, like big city or New York. Or I'm going to filter uh, bigrams where the words are a noun and a noun, so regression coefficient, right? That's those are two nouns. Or I might decide to do trigrams, and I will filter trigrams that have an article, an article, and a noun, like great big city, right? Or an article, a noun, and a noun, a noun, um, an article, and a noun, three nouns together, or a noun, a preposition, and a noun, right? So Bridges of Madison, Men in Black, right? So these are these are techniques to filter these bigrams and make them even more informative. So for example, in the same corpus now, if I just filter those tag patterns, I will get my top occurring bigrams be New York, which is an article and a noun, United States, Los Angeles, and so on and so forth, right? So oil prices, that tells me something about the, the, um, the text. So this is how we can use tags, which we saw in the previous slide, in the previous video, and this concept of frequency of bigrams or frequency of words to actually get some meaning from a text.